Hello and welcome again to Horsch Live here from our small broadcasting studio at the Horsch headquarters, the Sitzenhof in Germany. I'm Johannes and I'll be your host for this session. Well, we're way into day three uh, of Horsch Live, uh, of our virtual event, and we're actually running late. So if that is, isn't a good sign that we're doing quite well and that you're liking what we're doing, I don't know what else could be. For those of you who join us for the first time, um, just a quick reminder on what is Horsch Live. Um, well, we would have loved to have you here today in person. Obviously, we can't. COVID is limiting us in interacting with you personally. So this is our creative solution in getting in touch with you anyway. And um, Horsch Live, the interactive format, a virtual event. Most importantly, so that this is actually interactive, is you. So hopefully it's not only you hearing from us, but also us hearing from you. So please feel free to ask all your questions. Just use the chat function of your streaming channel and um, write your questions in there and we try to answer as many of, the, of those questions as possible, either directly via the chat or live after and following the speaker's presentation. Now, getting right away to our next guest. Our next guest will actually cover a topic that we have just been covering with our previous speaker, Joel Williams. And it's a topic that we have been dealing with for, or for about a year now. It's regen regenerative farming. And um, actually one of the reasons that we are dealing with this is that we have met our next guest for the first time. And our next guest is Joe Wecker, a German-born farmer who has been uh, living and farming in uh, Western Canada since decades. And um, yeah, Joe runs the Wecker Farms certified organic grains farms in, in the Regina Plains, Saskatchewan, Canada. He actually knows Joel Williams, our previous speaker, quite well because Joel is uh, Joe's educator on the topics of uh, intercropping and nutrition farming. And Joe will now talk to us um, and present us the practical life view of intercropping and nutrition farming on his farm, the Wecker Farms. Welcome, Joe. Well, hello, hello everyone, and thank you for joining me on my topic, intercropping and nutrition farming. Um, and thank you, Horsch, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this talk, those topics. Um, we'll get right to it. So who we are, we are a family farm and we farm uh, in southeastern Saskatchewan, um, just 35 minutes southeast of Regina. Um, grain farming, um, pulse, oil seeds. You can see here on the map roughly about 100 miles north of the US border. Here you can see our farm. We have a very flat land, no shelter belts really. Um, yeah, as flat as it can be, you can see it right there. So what we do, we farm 9,000 acres roughly, 6,000 of those are certified organic, 3,000 are in transition to organic. Um, every acre is farmed in, under the nutritional farming system and um, trying to have a diversity of crops, cover crops, intercrops, green manure, and our annual rainfall is roughly 15 inches. The last four years, we've been really in a drought in drought years. Um, I don't think we had combined um, in those four years our annual rainfall. So hopefully next year we're gonna see some rain again. Here are the different crops we grow: uh, durum, spring wheat, oats, uh, flax. We do some alfalfa for seed production, coarse and weed. Uh, spelt, emmer, those are organic peas, lentils, chickpeas, and then uh, some examples of intercrops we are growing. And it's not every year we grow the same kind of intercrops, um, just depends on the rotation that year what we grow together. So why intercropping? Um, I think the most important part is on, on top is biodiversity for better soil and plant health. Um, increase in beneficial insects, 
um, the mycorrhiza bridge. Uh, if we do have a boracica in our um, in our crop year, in our rotation, nutrient exchange we see very often in uh, with peas in the in the rotation and giving up some nitrogen on into the companion crop. Synergistic growth. Uh, we want to see it as synergistic and not as a competition. We use it because uh, we can use less fertility and inputs. It gives us more ground cover, um, less weeds, um, higher residue for ground cover, and uh, in a lot of years, especially the drought years and years that where the weather plays a big role and not doing what it's supposed to do is risk management. Here we see um, a cereal, an oat um, with some peas on the left hand side. You can see the oat um, with the root system uh, pushing out, out the sugars you can see. And on the left hand side you can see the peas with the oats. Um, totally different root function, totally different root structure. Uh, totally different pH on in the root zone and just different kind of nutrient release we, we get from that. And here's again um, a cereal root and right in the middle you can see actually the, the pulse, the P root and the nodules in there. This crop here it's an example, it's uh, yellow mustard and maple peas. Um, we grow those two crops together. Uh, we started growing them together mainly because of maple peas like to go flat at harvest time or just before harvest. And we used the, old, uh, we used the, the mustard to keep the peas up and make combining easier. And that's that's quite a nice way to uh, to use the the yellow mustard to keep the peas up, and that gives us the opportunity to grow maple peas that are usually high in price because they're harder to grow because of that simple reason. They like to go flat at harvest time or just before. Here's another picture of the peas and oats. You can see the sorry the peas and mustard. You can see the mustard just starting to flower. Uh, peas are hanging in there and grow up, grow with the oat, with the mustard, trying to climb as as it grows, as they grow up. This is an example of organic flax and chickpeas. Um, we grew those for two years in a row, three years in a row. Um, nice way to grow them together. Um, on the flax and chickpeas, you can see here on the next picture when it's a little bigger, flax is flowering and you can see some chickpea pods there already. That way, usually chickpeas are sprayed five, six, seven times with a fungicide. Um, in organics, we obviously have don't have that, uh, we can't spray the fungicide. Um, and what we notice is when we grow the chickpeas with the flax, um, there is actually no need for any fungicide. Um, there's some kind of relationship going on, I think, mostly below ground where there is no need for a fungicide anymore, and that is quite significant. Here you can see some organic emmer uh, underseeded with clover. You can't see the clover there, I guess, but uh, um, just another organic crop. And I want to point out that intercropping, I don't always see us growing two crops together, harvest them together, and then after harvest, separate them. I also see intercropping as a lot of times underseeded clover, um, where you just don't harvest one crop, but is there as a beneficial crop, as a companion. And we use it mostly in cereals. Here you see um, oats and peas. Um, very nice crop, very, uh, my, one of my favorites crop to grow together, oats and peas. Uh, peas do very well with oats, you can see here. Um, pretty much healthy leaves all the way down to the bottom. Um, quite a nice, um, 
quite nice companion crops to grow together. Here's another one uh, with oats and peas. Uh, you can see the oats are quite tall already and that's uh, some pea pods showing up. Um, that was a pretty good crop. Those peas are Marifat peas. Uh, and again, we, we picked specialty peas um, because they're harder to grow on, it, on their own. And with the oats, we, they're easier to grow, easier to manage, easier to manage weed control, especially on the organic side to give, we have the oats in there to give more competition for weeds and um, yeah, ground cover. Here's an example of um, spring wheat under seeded uh, with alfalfa. And some of that alfalfa is actually, uh, some is volunteer, some is seeded. And that's just from growing alfalfa seed. You have a lot of years volunteer alfalfa coming and we actually use it. Um, don't try to have too much in the field, but we use it as another companion crop. Here you can see the alfalfa growing up the spring wheat. Um, that's one of the heavier spots, <clears throat> almost too heavy, but still okay. Um, what we noticed when we do have alfalfa in with the spring wheat, our protein seemed to be one and a half to two percent higher, and the yield most of the time never suffer, suffers. So uh, those are the spring wheat is a nice crop with the alfalfa to produce high protein weeds. Here's the same field um, after swathing it. And you can see the alfalfa, uh, the alfalfa in the bottom, quite green. And uh, although it, in that year it never rained after harvest, uh, so the alfalfa didn't take off too much, but yet the uh, fields were green and going green through the winter. Here is a picture of the yellow mustard and maple peas. Uh, right at harvest time and combining is just the same a little bit of different settings now going to uh, nutrition farming um, which, uh, I was just gonna talk a little bit about what soil tests and what we do with them tissue tests and bring tissue tests and toric soil tests number together and see uh, what we have in the soil and if it shows up in the plant and what we have in the soil and what happens if it doesn't show up in the plant. And not always is it that when you have sufficient nutrients in the soil that it ends up in the plant. And here's just an example from, from our soil test on the left hand side. You can see um, our traditional soil test, um, what everybody uses when they do soil tests. Uh, on soluble nutrients. Um, and on the right hand side, you have an example of total nutrients. And we always want to look at total nutrients. And those are, those are the nutrients that are not available, not, not soluble, but available uh, and can be made available uh, with enough soil life. And that's why we focus also in the intercropping it's uh, about biodiversity and soil life. So we're trying to, we have lots of nutrients. We can see here um, on the green graphs that are there, but sometimes not always available. So to stimulate soil, stimulate soil health, soil life, um, instead of in, on the organic side and the conventional side, put, instead of putting soluble nutrients down, we put soil stimulants down, um, trying to uh, just stimulate the soil life, especially around the plant root, root and give, um, give the soil life enough start, kickstart, so we can start releasing some of those locked up nutrients. And that's our mix, what we, uh, put in furrow, right in furrow in with, with the seed. And just a little bit of guano, humic acid, molasses, boron, 
a little bit of fish, liquid fish, the sink if needed, some kelp, um, and then you can add some uh, beneficial microbes, effective microbes, um, some uh, mycorrhizal fungi if we need, or, or Adsorobacter. Um, what we also do is we treat our seed with vermicompost that we do ourselves in the winter here at home. And I have some pictures of that later on. Then uh, we do tissue tests um, on all the fields at least once. And if there's any missing nutrient, um, we compare that with what's in the soil, what should be available, and if it's in the tissue test and if it's available. If not, we can very cheap uh, go in and um, apply those nutrients that are missing. And for us, it's really most of the time boron that we are missing. If we do go in with boron or any nutrients that is missing, we always add um, kelp and fulvic acid with it. Uh, it's just a nice plant health promoter um, that it's it's cheap to to apply and it, it never hurts even on, on a healthy crop to just give it that little kick. Here's an example of our little home compost, wormy compost uh, factory. I guess we we have ten ten containers. We grow our worms in and feed them over the winter and use that product um, then as a seed treatment uh, in the spring. And here you can see a, a pea that was treated with the vermicompost and uh, some resovium um, and pretty much shows you a nice, uh, nice nodules there. Here's one of our tissue tests. Uh, that was on flax and uh, that one was um, <clears throat> no phosphate applied. That was on our conventional side, no phosphate applied. Um, half the amount of nitrogen as normal. And as you can see here, um, there's nothing to worry about in that crop. And that was a really good crop that year, actually. So, it's not always, we're trying to push the boundaries and um, this time we used to push the boundaries as how much we can apply uh, and how much yield we can get out of that crop and now we are actually the opposite, trying to push the boundaries of how little can we apply without any yield loss. Then here we have a bricks meter. It's uh, probably our most used meter on the farm during the summer. It's just a quick way to find out how good your plant health health is out there. And you, you pretty much measure the sugar. Um, and that's for us a way to figure out if there's any issues out there and, or not. And if we do end up with low bricks readings, um, we usually take a tissue test right away and see what what is going what is going on in that crop. If we do have to come in and apply some nutrients, like here you can see the boron. Um, we do, like I said, um, add some fulvic acid as a chelator with it, some kelp, and on on this example actually I added a little bit of a sugar with it um, just for beneficial insects and um, yeah, plant health. Just get a little bit of sugar out on the, onto the plant. And you can see our organic spring weed um, where we apply some of that, of some of those nutrients, uh, fulvic acid and boron and kelp. Now, why, why do we do that? Um, so we switched organic five years ago um, because we were organic consumers and we wanted to supply that market and th that belief. Uh, we saw some soil issues going on and we knew we had to change a little bit the, 
the way we were farming and that was where the intercropping came in as well uh, we just questioned the status quo um, and connected the dots i guess down the road when you have problems in the field um, which sometimes you don't realize until the problems get larger or more problems happen and you start to think what got me to this point um, and at the end of the day, I mean, what I want to do is a regenerative organic farming, and that's where we are moving towards. And yeah. And for us, uh, important part of that is soil life. Yeah. And it's always in our focus. Um, what can we do to increase our soil health? Um, what are we doing every time we do something we question does that impact our soil life uh, soil health um, and how can we what can we do to to benefit it and uh, that's pretty much before we do anything always what we ask ourselves um, healthy soil creates healthy plants um, or healthy plants create healthy soils you can see it both ways uh, that's just our main focus is it's plant health, soil health, and yeah, we put a look. We put a lot of focus on insects, especially bees, and all the other beneficial insects out there. Um, we are to a point where we have to create an area. For those insects to draw back to when the farming is happening in our growing season because we don't have many areas anymore where we can say that <clears throat> insects can thrive and we have years where it's very sometimes seldom that we can see bees flying around so what we're trying to do is with the intercropping also um, create areas where we extend um, just extend the time where beneficial insects can have access to and can thrive and at the end of the day we are doing it for our consumers for those who pay us for our product um, I believe um, our consumer is expecting more from us and not just the way we did it all the time and we're going to tackle that and we're going to work with our consumers and our consumers are my customers know how we are farming and what we are doing to trying to make a difference and uh, i think at the end of the day um, they want to work together with us because of it so that's the end of my um, talk and any questions you have please feel free to ask yeah now with me live from sadly saskatchewan in canada joe good morning joe good morning how are you joe thanks for joining us thank you very much for this um interesting presentation on uh, farming at the wecker farms um and thank you very much for being available available for a question and answer Yep, no problem. Starting right away with the first question, Joe. Um, the first question is on the transition process. So you mentioned that you've not been uh, or you've not fa farmed the way you farm right now all your life. So there mm -hmm. was a time when you transitioned and you mentioned that you're with part of your farm, you're still in that transition process. Um, for a grower who would want to do the same thing, who want to go in that direction, um, when starting, when wh what what's kind of the time frame one would have to think about until seeing first positive results, specifically on soil health? Um, on the intercropping, I mean, you can see it right away. Um, that that's the reason why we cut out the fungicide first year, on for example, flax and chickpeas or flax and lentils. Um, it's it's right away in the same season. Soil health, it takes longer for soil health to come back, um, especially if you talk about the nutrition side of farming. 
uh, using less fertilizer. I think like what we did, we used a three year period to cut back on that, on the fertilizer slowly. So the soil, the soil life actually comes back and, uh, and can take over from there. And it, it can be easily done in three years. Uh, and we were down to 50% of, of inputs. Okay. And yeah. the side effect when you do cut fertilizer on a nutrition, nutritious farming, mm -hmm. um, we're not pumping the crop full of nitrates. Mm -hmm. And you can, ha you can see that right away on uh, the plant stays healthy longer. You, you don't need those fungicides mm -hmm. as often and there's less insect pressure. You can see it right away. Very interesting. Um, talking about inputs, um, I mean, a very important question obviously is economics, right? And um, mm -hmm. I mean, by cutting back inputs, um, me as a grower obviously um, is saving money, but what is like the general margin situation um, when going the way you are going? Um, can you tell us a little more on this? On the on the nutrition side, on the nutrition farming. Yes. Yeah. Um, within three years, we cut our fertility to about fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So th that cost is gone. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit of cost um, you spend on the humic acid on uh, foliar nutrition, uh, but you probably will spend that anyways on on the fungicide. So um, you could figure roughly half of the fertilizer costs after the three year period. Mm -hmm. And not all the fields are the same and you, you know your fields better. Some fields respond quicker than some yeah. others. Yeah. And that's due to soil life in, in some fields and some yeah mm -hmm. respond just a little slower. But yeah. for us after three years, fifty percent of the input costs were gone. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Well, fifty percent is definitely it's, not little. The, that's that's quite something. The, the but thing it's, yeah. yeah, it's hard to if I if I tell a normal farmer that and yeah. I say, look, I, I use this and this, and I cut my fertility, and I don't lose a, uh, a lot of yield. Mm -hmm. The first reaction is, yeah, okay, well, I'll go on to the next guy because he's just blowing hot smokes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in that system and if you start to see it work, mm -hmm. uh, and especially, if, I mean, um, if you if you, you still use your urea um, and fertilize it the same way, mm -hmm. all we do is add some to it, mm -hmm. so you not lose it, mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. And also the humic acid you add to it mm -hmm. is also uh, feed food for soil life. Yeah. So it's not that we cut everything by half, yeah. and the rest comes from nowhere. Yeah. It's just we don't lose it. And that's where the difference comes in. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's very important to 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 remember that. Yeah. We just mentioned that you're not losing it. That's. Um, and that's yeah. for the European farmer. It's especially important because you've been told to cut your fertility use. Um, you've probably been told to cut your insecticide use, your your fungicide use, yeah. and those are the the tools you can use right yeah. away. Yeah. That's. I mean, you're absolutely addressing a, a true point there. We're facing that, what you just mentioned. So it's definitely, I guess, for our viewers, something to 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 look closer to uh, afterwards and and and, and consider. Um, you just mentioned the inputs, the things you add to that. Um, we previously heard Joel Williams speaking. Um, I think you two are are working together um, here and there. So, but. Where do you actually get your knowledge on 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 what to add on 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 the recipes that you're um, that you're that you're mixing or the, your mixtures? You know, is this trial and error, or is this a knowledge network um, around the world, or is it you know a small group in Canada? So, uh, how does that work? Oh, well, I actually I came across a, a guy named Graham Said mm -hmm. from Australia, and I went to one. To a couple of his courses, and that's pretty much what he what he teaches mm -hmm. um, nutrition farming, mm -hmm. and um, that's how I've been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. And I started using the system, mm -hmm. and I saw the results right away. And I knew right then and there is that this is exactly what was missing in my in my knowledge base. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I could have had had it way easier back then if I would have known. Mm -hmm. And you just started using some of the products. I mean, you, most of them you can buy and mix up yourself, right? You don't have to buy them mm -hmm. pre-made. Mm -hmm. So we just use it and, and see how the crop responds. Mm -hmm. And then you just start to know more people that use it and, uh, and you go from there. Now, we talked about reducing inputs. Now, we also talked about adding inputs. Um, again, coming to that cost perspective, how does that mm -hmm. um, compare to each other? Um, reducing and, 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 and adding, is that more or less, you know, do you end up with the same cost or, or how, how does that work in your, in your calculation? No, on the first year with the, on the fertility side, if you cut 10% of your fertilizer, mm -hmm you add the same amount of fumic acid mm -hmm. to it. So you're not gaining the f on the first year. Yeah. But then when you cut down to 75% yeah. or down to 50%, um, it's very little. It's like per acre, it's it's $5 yeah. an acre or something like that, mm -hmm. um, $15 a hectare, mm -hmm. where you add mm -hmm. the humic acid to it and, and some of that stuff. And um, maybe just briefly coming to yields, you mentioned that you see a small yield loss, but 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 not really, not really, or a decreasing. Um, well, I wouldn't say yield potential, but but your yields are slightly lower. But like you said, it it seems to be slightly and not really, not really worrying lower. Um, can you just maybe give a give a give an average figure or something, um, an indication on on what you found found on your farm in terms of of reduced yields? In percentage or something? Um, yeah, it depends on the crops. Mm -hmm. um, in the barley, we never had a yield loss mm -hmm. uh, versus my neighbors. And um, I'm, I'm sharing yields with two of my good friends, so I know what he's pulling off. Mm -hmm. On the barley, we never did use yield. Okay. On the weed, we're probably at 10, 15% lower. Mm -hmm. um, on flax, we completely cut out nitrogen, actually. Um, and the yield actually never dropped. So it depends on the crop. Yeah. Some crops do well better with no or less fertility than, than others. Yeah. And you got, remember, the new wheat varieties that are out on the market today, they're all bred for high fertility. Yeah. And that's why we are actually going back to the older varieties mm -hmm. and, uh, and the ancient grains, because they do as good mm -hmm. with way less fertility. Mm -hmm. Barley, the new bar barley varieties here in, in Canada, we haven't seen uh, a yield drop at all. Mm -hmm. So, but that's an interesting point you just mentioned there. So you're you're kind of not using what is supposed to be the latest technology in seed breeding. Um, you're rather going back. So where did you get that seeds from? Um, is that something that's that's just available on the market still, or do you need special yeah. breeders? It's still on the market. We still, there's still, like sometimes we have to look for it and there's a small bin somebody has left and he doesn't know what to do with it. And yeah, we got it. Um, a lot of times we talk to the mills. Um, they, different varieties taste different. So we, we choose our variety from there. Um, yeah, it's very interesting actually. Uh, Everybody on the farming side asks about yield. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually asks about how does it taste in the bread. Yeah. And our bakeries actually say, "Listen, I want to, I like your wheat, yeah. but we need to make it, we do a taste yeah. a taste test, yeah. and then we have to go from there." So yeah. it's actually interesting. We're producing something we eat, and we never ask about the taste. Yeah. But if that would be a restaurant, if yeah. that would be a restaurant, sure. Sometimes we wouldn't be in business. Yeah, but that kind of leads me to the next question. Um, at the end of your presentation, you, you and during your presentation, you made it definitely clear that, that you're looking at the final consumer and you addressed and mentioned that at the, at the end of your presentation um, specifically. Mm. And now you mentioned something that, I mean, the majority of, 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 of a con conventional farmers and growers just do not need to and have to or shouldn't, well, maybe not shouldn't, but just can't worry about because what we do 
is uh, we take the grain, the, 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 the crop to the next elevator, right? And there's no one who asks uh, about taste. So can you mm -hmm. tell us a little more about um, the ways you trade your grains, um, um, how that works, that you're actually in that situation where someone asks you, how, what's the taste, you know? To, how do you get into that? And, and do you need to kind of, did you have to change or do you need to change your, your imagery, um, like doing presentations like you, for example, um, kindly um, just did for us. Is that something where you need to pay more attention to? Um, kind of giving your farm and what you do an image? Um, or, or is it just B2B? On the conventional side, it is tough to find somebody right now that cares about what we do different. Um, it might be easier if you have, for example, a chickpea buyer and uh, all is all they do is buy chickpeas and you tell them, listen, do you know this has been sprayed so and so often with a fungicide? Mine does. Mine never had the fungicide. Then they come and say, okay, actually, you know what? We want to work with you. Mm -hmm. It's way easier on the organic side mm -hmm. because we usually talk to you straight down to the mill mm -hmm. um, and they know what we are doing. They know when they deal with us, they always get quality. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting something in the rail car mm -hmm. that I wouldn't buy myself. Mm -hmm. And they can just count on that. And then you can tell them the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing for to our, to our yeah, it's a handful of, of buyers and users. Mm -hmm. And and do you see when you when you talk to your end users to your buyers, is there is there increased demand? So would they be looking for more people like you? Or would you be afraid of more people actually uh, uh, transitioning? Um, into the organics, we can't keep up with with the production. Actually, we're turning away customers because we can't, we can't supply them with, with the greens. Um, there could be another 100 farms like us and we would be fine. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't grow commodity crops. Mm -hmm. If you grow a commodity crop, you're in the same situation as anybody else is in. Okay. So yeah. grow especially niche crops yeah. where there is a market for it and then produce quality. Well, I think that's pretty much a good statement to the end. Um, I would like to ask you one more question. Um, that would be, again, on the question like the intercropping side of, of, of your business. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you you spoke about which crops go along well with another. Um, again, how did you find those 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 good combinations? Was that something that you found out for your farm yourself? Is this something that a grower has to kind of consider individually for his farm, or is there rules? Is there is there is there kind of general um, uh, rules that 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 count worldwide that 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 you can just take from one farm to the other? Yeah, you can, I mean, if you got to figure it out for your own farm, uh, what grows well together, what is similar in uh, maturity, so you're not growing a crop that's ripe in the field for three weeks while the other one is still growing. Um, and then there's, there's a, some of my friends, we, we talk back and forth and throw ideas around. And then at the end of the day, it, it's down to your farm and figure out what you use for seeding rate and, and crops at the end. Uh, a big role, there's a big role that comes into play is if you do grow intercrop where you need to separate, mm -hmm. can I actually separate it? Mm -hmm. So before you even talk about putting any intercrops in, yeah. take the two crops, mix them together and find a guy that that has a, a cleaning plant yeah. and see, can you actually separate that? Yeah. Most of the time, or the biggest mistake what guys do is they, they grow an intercrop and then at and the end of the day, they have, yeah. they have, uh, yeah. they can't separate yeah. it. Yeah, true, uh, good, good point to the end. Joe, unfortunately, um, that is it for us today. Um, we run out of time, kind of. Uh, um, so thank you very much uh, once again for this interesting insights on 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 your farm and and on intercropping and nutrition farming in general. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, all no the best problem. for the upcoming season, um, and hope to meet 
and talk to you soon again. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. So to all the viewers, um, that was Joe Wecker from Sadly in Canada on nutrition farming and intercropping. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and that was also the end of um, the two sessions or the overall topic, uh, regenerative farming. Horsch Life will continue with one final contribution. Um, that will be a presentation by Konstantin Horsch on the aggravation farm in the Czech Republic. This session will start at 6 um, six o'clock Central uh, European time. We'll be glad if you join us again. Um, thanks for now. Thank you very much and good evening.